Aloha and welcome to Knitted Paradise, where the needles are clicking and the yarn is squishy. My name is Lucia and you can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Pearl of the Pacific. Today is Sunday, April, uh, sorry, no, what did I say April? <laughs> September 6th and it's Labor Day weekend here in the United States and it's very lovely weather if you like warm and humid. <laughs> So it's been nice. I've been biking a lot this week and trying to not sweat too much. It's just, it's just, it's so humid. You just feel wet. I don't know if anyone else gets this. Like I did grow up in Hawaii, but it doesn't get like, it's humid, but not like this. It's not, you don't get that combination of hot and humid. Sometimes it's kind of not cold and humid, but it, it, there's never this combination where you just feel hot and wet all the time. Sometimes you feel cold and wet. I remember one time I, I put on the, 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 like I was getting dressed in the morning and I put on my clothes and I'm like these just feel damp so I threw them in the dryer for like five, five minutes and then I, well, I was like that that's much better. <laughs> you can get a little damp in Hawaii especially on the wet side which is where I grew up. Anyway I digress. This is episode 87 and I have some things to share with you. I have a little bit of knitting and, <coughs> excuse me, some Lego, <coughs> excuse me, and a funny story about sheep. And it's not really a story. It's a, it's a, it's a story. It's an, it's an interesting fact about sheep. And what else do I have? Oh, I have a couple games. Someone asked me to show one and then I pulled another one that I thought would be fun. So let's get started. Blow the conch shell. We have a giveaway happening in the group, the Knitted Paradise Podcast and Ravelry, to get one of three patterns from the Six Bits Storybook for Knitters pattern collection. And yeah, the prompt for that is how do you immerse yourself in knitting? Out, whatever way you would like to answer that is great for me. I'm going to leave it open for one more week. I, I didn't really state how long it was going to be open, but I'm going to leave it open for one more week so that if you want a chance to enter, you have a chance. And next week on the podcast, I will pull for a winner. So, ta-da! The other announcement I have is that I, I had, this is, I guess it's a funny hopefully you don't get grossed out kind of story. I have really tiny ears, as you can see. I have really tiny ears. And I have a lot of earwax, like ridiculous amounts of earwax. It's not even funny. Like, I don't even know where it goes. Anyway, periodically, my ears get really clogged to the path, to the point where I can't hear out of them. I can only hear what's going on inside my head. It's really bizarre. Anyway, that has happened at this very... <laughs> Over the last like four days, I cannot hear out of this ear. So my volume control is a little off because to me, I sound really loud. And luckily through singing and performing, I kind of know the level of my voice, just kind of like how it feels to me, you know, how loud I'm singing or how soft I'm singing. So I've been okay. Like my friends and my husband haven't complained about me talking too loudly or too softly. But I'm just letting you know that if I sound weird, you probably wouldn't have noticed. I just sound really bizarre to myself because I can hear myself a lot louder. It also makes other things really challenging. Like when I, when I was hanging out with my friends this afternoon, I had to have them all on this side because I'm like, I can hear out of this ear. This ear is just really cool. I've tried absolutely everything. And right now I'm just kind of leaving it for the day in hopes that it will kind of drain itself away. If not, I will go see the doctor this week and they'll clean it out. That's kind of just the thing that I do once a year. <laughs> it just happens. I think it's the humidity and other things. And anyway, I'm, I've almost gotten used to the fact that I can't hear out of that ear. So it's going to be really weird when I actually can hear out of it. A little weird. Um, what's the other thing? Oh, funny story about not being able to hear out of here. Things that sound really interesting. Um, don't try to have anyone talk to you while you are eating. Anything crunchy. 
like my husband was trying to talk to me while I was eating granola this morning for breakfast. And I was like, honey, I can't hear anything you're saying. So I need to make some sort of hand gestures like I need to talk to you and I will stop chewing. The other thing that sounds really cool is um, I was taking a shower, or I've been taking a shower like I do every day. Um, hearing the water against your head, very cool. So if you want to hear what it sounds like, go in the shower and plug your ears and then put water in your head. It sounds really cool. <laughs> you might be totally weirded out by this. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I've learned this week. <laughs> the interesting things that you learn when you can't hear out of one ear. It happens. All right, on to the knitting. That's what you're here for, not to hear weird stories about Lucia's tiny ears. Okay, so I have been knitting on three pairs of socks. It's the same three I showed you last week. Actually, I showed you five last week because I had finished them. I didn't finish any this week, but here, we'll start with these. Oh, I just started. I was about to do a cable, and then I didn't grab the cable needle. Okay, these are my white sandy beach socks. Ta-da! And I think I had the toe of these last week. Anyway, these are knitting up quite nicely. I forgot how much I love this pattern. It's really quick, really easy to knit. I mean, this is kind of how I make my socks, so they're kind of standard for me. And I just finished the gusset, the bottom of the heel gusset. And I think I'm gonna do this round on the top and then do the heels. I think that's the point where I'm at. So, I mean, I picked these up a couple days ago because I was kind of at a stuck place on my other socks, which I'll show you in a minute, and just went zoom along. So I'm really happy with how these are turning out. I'm really excited to actually have these knit. Um, if you remember, I knit the ones that I did for the design and then I did the photo shoot with them and then I ripped them out because they were a little too small. And I've done them with, I think, two more stitches. I tried four more and that was just too big. So I'm still trying to figure out, like I thought I had figured out a standard st uh, stitch count for myself, but then I added more because the cable pulls stuff in. And I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. But these are the White Sandy Beach socks. You can purchase them in my Patterns from Ravelry. And yeah, I designed them. They are um, written for two at a time. I did specifically write them for that. You can knit them one at a time. It's very easy if you've knit socks before to uh, convert them to one at a time or double points or however you like to knit socks. They are specifically written for two at a time toe up though. You don't have to knit them that way, but it was kind of like a how I do my socks kind of deal. And that's what these are. So, ta-da. Those are coming along. I'll probably, I don't know if I'll do the heel. To, I, those are kind of, I took those socks with me today as I was, um, we're back at choir now. We took a break for the summer so today was our first day back. Uh, well, we had rehearsal on Thursday, and this is our first day back singing um, for the devotional program at the house worship. And so I took those, and then my husband had to work, so I got a ride with my friends, and they had a bunch of errands to do. And I was like, great, because half the errands that you need to do, I also need to do. So I just tagged along with them and knit a whole bunch in the car and during rehearsal and stuff like that. So... A lot of that was actually knit today, which was kind of awesome. The other socks that I have that have not gotten as much attention are my Batgirl socks. I think last week I hadn't even cast on, so this week they are actually on the needles. And this is, oh, the yarn for the White Sandy Beach socks, I forgot, is Leading Men Fiber Arts Show Stealer in the Poseidon colorway. So I forgot that. This is No Maker's Bungalow Gnome in Batgirl. And ta-da! I don't know where the front of the sock is. I think that's the front. Yeah, I just started the bat symbol pattern. And I have the bat symbol pattern and the Star Trek, which I looked it up. It's a chevron. It's called the Star Trek chevron. It's the, the Star Trek emblem symbol thing. Anyway, those patterns are... They're just just the chart, and um, 
Those are going to be available, I think, probably this week. They're pretty much ready. I forget what I had to do on them. Oh, I had to come up with some sort of description, which I'm absolutely terrible at. So once I come up with a description, then I will just put them up. But I, the, pat, the PDF is ready to go, which is nice. So those will get some attention this week. And the third socks I've been working on are my new design that I finished my last one, which I showed you this last week. And I'll show you this one. Um, I The pattern is being tested right now, the Lude Milla sock pattern. And the testers haven't found any problems with it yet. This is good. <laughs> And so that will be available probably within the next couple of weeks, I'm guessing. I don't have a hard deadline. I didn't give them a hard deadline. I just said, you know, whenever you get to it, sooner is better. And yes, so that is coming along. I will need to get some more photos of that to show or to put in the pattern. So I have more of the kind of, like the pattern is written. The testers are knitting it. It's more of the, the last the kind of final adjustments, kind of putting pictures in there, formatting, um, making sure everything looks nice, making sure everything's, you know, spelled correctly, and that's what my husband's for. He's an editor, so he does the kind of final edit of it. And, yeah, so those are good to go. And these are my new pattern, which I'll kind of show briefly in the back here. And these are out of another Crafty Girl Strong Sport, which is her new sport sock weight base. So it's an 80% merino, 20% nylon base. And I I fig finally figured out the stitch counts I needed for a sport weight sock. And I saw this stitch pattern when I was looking for stitch patterns for my shawl design. And I was like, I need to use this on something. And I saw this yarn and I was like, yep, that's it. So it is, it's got cables up the front and then some lace on the sides and in between. And then there's, it's a top of the foot gusset with a pattern in the middle there. And then the cables will go up the side of the leg. And then there's going to be a pattern in the middle here in the back, which I tried. I, I actually, I was knitting these two at a time up until uh, I turned the heel. And then I had to, when I had to move um, I'm having a hard time writing this pattern. I, it's really cool and I can make it work, but I'm having a hard time explaining it. So <laughs> this is taking a little longer than my other one. But uh, what was I going to say? When I had to switch the cable from the front needle to the back needle, I took it, I separated them because it's really hard when you're knitting two at a time to switch stuff from the front to back. It can be done, I've done it um, quite a few times. But when I was figuring out how I was gonna make it work, I needed them separately. So there are, there's two here that I've been working on kind of in tandem at the moment. So I'm really, I love this base of yarn. I'm very excited about it. And I'm just figuring out how to write up this pattern because it's really cool and I really like it. I was, I was funny, I was showing it to Sarah, who's the dyer behind another crafty girl. And she's like, oh, I don't really see cables on the top of socks very often. And I was like, hmm, why don't you see them? And then I realized, oh, they're kind of bulky. That's why they're not on the top of socks. So I tried the sock on and I put a shoe on, my, one of my favorite shoes that I wear all the time. And I can't feel it at all. It's funny because my other sock design, the white sandy beach socks, also has a cable up the front. I can't feel them in shoes at all. So it's, it's spread out enough that I don't feel the cables um, as a problem. Although if you have very sensitive feet, then you might, but especially since they're sport weight, they are probably more of boot socks or wear around the house socks, but I'm really enjoying them. And uh, I worked on them a lot this week. The, the, the pattern on the front is super easy to memorize really quick to knit, um, just like the Lude Milla socks. They look really complicated, but they're really simple. Uh, but then I got to kind of a point where I actually had to pay attention and count and kind of write things as I went. And so I worked on them a bunch yesterday, but I there's some parts that I'm just not 
I like how I knit them. I'm just trying to figure out what's the easiest way to explain them. So I may have to rip back some on those and kind of rewrite them in an easier way. Because the way I did it is kind of like, well, it worked for me, but it's not the simplest way to do it. So there was some finagling that happened and and then I finally figured out like, oh, this is probably the easiest way to do this. So I may rip back and kind of knit through according to the directions that I wrote to make sure that they're kind of correct and make sense. So I have a couple test knitters lined up for those, but I, I usually like to have at least or about three. So if you're interested in test knitting some sport weight socks, get in contact with me. Hopefully that pattern will be ready within the next couple weeks. We'll see. <sighs> and that's it for what's on my needles. It's pretty much been those three socks kind of alternating depending on what I was feeling like. <laughs> I was trying to work on the sport weight ones as much as I could, but now I'm at a point where I have to actually think about them. And so that's when I picked up the white sandy beach socks and then just knit a whole foot practically and about to turn the heel. And <laughs> Next week, it'll probably be the Batgirl socks. We'll see that kind of attention. All right, set sail, nothing. <laughs> I thought maybe, but no. Last week was kind of a, a, a weird instance where I finished a whole pair of socks in a week. Oh, that's okay. Okay, flora and fauna, I have a funny, it's, it's, it's a funny news story. Anyway, one of my viewers, William, hello William, sent me this funny article this morning that I was reading. And it's in actually kind of the history of the merino sheep that, I probably should pull this up, I'm just gonna do this from memory. But the merino sheep is actually, um, it's a man-made breed of sheep. It's not like a naturally occurring sheep. And like way back when the English shepherds and the Spanish shepherds breeded their sheep together to create what is now the Merino sheep. And the interesting thing about Merino sheep is their wool never stops growing. So they have to live in captivity and they have to be sheared twice a year or at least once a year. Um, Cause otherwise you get, so those, those sheep, those freak sheep we've been seeing in the news about like, I think there was Shrek the sheep who like lived in a cave for six years and had, they sheared off like 60 pounds of wool and then they found like Chris the sheep or Sean the sheep, I forget, anyway. And they sheared like almost 90 pounds of wool off of him and just kind of ridiculous amounts of wool. It's because their wool never stops growing. Normal wild sheep that you see just like in the wild, um, actually shed their wool kind of I guess probably in the summer like horses and cats and dogs kind of shed at that in the spring but merino sheep don't shed so they have to live in captivity and they have to be sheared I mean I guess they don't have to live in captivity but they have to be sheared because otherwise they um after a while it just they can't they die because it's too heavy and they can't go to the bathroom and they can't eat because they have too much wool in their face I just thought that was really kind of, that was really interesting that, I mean, merino, which is a fine wool, which everyone loves. I mean, most of the stuff we knit with merino is kind of this freak of nature sheep that was man-made way back when. That this poor sheep, like, has to be sheared. <laughs> I just thought that was really interesting. So I'll, I'll link the article in the show notes. I didn't think about that before, but I'll link it in the, in the show notes that... Like, merino sheep literally cannot live in the wild. They'll just die. Like, that, I just thought that was really kind of intriguing. <laughs> so, interesting little known, maybe not little known fact. I didn't know that, so. I always kind of wonder, I'm like, why do they have to be sheared? It's because their wool never stops growing. That would be a reason. Plus, we like their wool, and we use it to make clothing, and it probably makes them a lot more pleasant in the summer because it's kind of hot with all that wool. Anyway, interesting fact. All right, next, from the mainland, I didn't get anything. Ooh, ooh. Uh, I feel like I did. Oh, I guess, no, it wasn't knitting related. Okay, that's why I'm like, wait, my husband has a package for me. Not knitting related. Okay. 
Now on to non-knitting related content. I have, we'll start with games because someone asked me to show these. So someone asked me to talk about, I posted on Instagram a picture of my cat next to this game called Exploding Kittens because I almost dropped this game, which is a game that was, the art is done by the same guy who does the oatmeal. Yes, it's the oatmeal, the onion, something else. Okay, I know it's right with the note. And so the art is amazing. Yeah, I think they did the game design as well, like him and his friends. And it's a very simple game. And here, I'll show you. So they uh, launched it on Kickstarter, and it went viral. Like, it was insane. The amount, it was the most backed anything on Kickstarter ever. And they earned tons and tons of money. And so they went from it being just a simple game in a box to having this very fancy magnetic box with all sorts of fancy things and special cards in any way. Uh, so this is the game. And one of the specials was this surprise in the box. So are you ready for this surprise? It's pretty great. <laughs> the box meows when you open it. It's pretty awesome. So the game here see them. So the game is kind of, it's it's a game of Russian roulette basically. So everyone gets a hand, your hand size doesn't matter, but in the deck you mix these exploding kittens. So it's these kittens doing, you know, things that kittens would do and, you know, causing explosions. Like, you know, cat chewing dynamite, cat sleeping on warp core and blowing up spaceships. There's a cat, you know, walking over a keyboard like he does, but it happens to be at a nuclear power plant or a nuclear launch facility. And then there's a cat eating a grenade or something like that. So there's these four exploding kittens. And this is just in the normal deck that comes with it. And if you draw one, then you're out. But there are these diffuse cards uh, like this one, diffuse via belly rubs that you can play to not die, basically. And, or there's kitten therapy. You can send your cat to kitten therapy. Or there's catnip sandwiches, which are pretty great. So you can use these diffuse cards, which you, everyone starts with one diffuse card in their hand. And you put the number of players minus one exploding kitten cards in the deck and then at, at your turn the only rule is you have to draw one you can play as many as you want you can do whatever you want but you have to draw one at the end of your turn unless there are cards that um there's cards that let you like skip like you can don a portable cheetah butt and skip your draw which lessens your chance of drawing a exploding kit well at least that turn your next turn you might uh, the other thing is there are these, there are note cards that you can play to counteract like attack cards. You can, um, like, so there's the attack war cards, like unleash the caterwalky. It's like this giant flying flame breathing cat. <laughs> so the, the funnest part about this game are the arts and the cards. Like, the game itself is really simple. Some people are like, oh, it's like kind of too simple. Like, the fun is just in the art and the kind of the ridiculousness of it. Um, there are also these, these cards. If you get a pair, here's the taco cat. If you get a pair, then you can steal a card from someone or there's other cards that, um, like let you uh, let that let your friend choose what card they're gonna give you. I forget which one or which. You can see the future. You can deploy like special ops bunnies, and you can see the top three cards. So you know if you're gonna get an exploding kitten, and then you can play a skip card, and the next person will draw an exploding kitten. Anyway, that's kind of the basics of the game, and it comes in this awesome box. That meows. There also, 
Uh, you can't get it, I don't think, at the moment, except if you were a Kickstarter backer. Um, I'm assuming that they'll be available soon. Also, that came with it was the Not Safe for Work deck, which I won't show you because it's a family-friendly show. But that has another set of funny cards. Some of them I think are funny, and some of them I'm like, uh, that's just a little too crude. But depends on your kind of humor. But you could take those and mix some of them into the normal deck to increase the amount of players that you can have, because you can mix them together. Originally, it was going to be like some extra cards, and then it became like through all the money that they made, they made it its own standalone game. But you can mix them together and then play with more people. So it's pretty fun. It's really just kind of ridiculous. That's really, I mean, the game mechanics are just so simple, but it's just, it's just ridiculous, like exploding kittens. That's really what it's all about. Uh, next, let's show some Lego. We'll just kind of alternate here. I wanted to show you, this was a thing that my husband built for a, as like a commissioned thing. Anyway, I try to explain it, but I just, it would get too complicated. So he built a room. Uh, it's like a child's bedroom. This is not a set you can buy. This is just something he came up with. And it's got the bed and it's got an area rug and it's got a desk with a lamp. And there's a lamp and it's got some trophies up here and a bat cowl. And then there's a, I'll show you the, this is the outside, but you can see it through the window of like a fence and a tree and a cloud, that's it. And then there's a, a portrait of Elmo here on the wall, which I think is really cute. And then he built a bunch of things to go in the room. Oh, there's also a, a tank back here. I think there's a fish or a turtle or a frog in there. There's nothing in there at the moment. Check them out. So the other things he built were like the chair for the desk. And the, the thing he built it for was, it's a children's magazine. I guess I can say that. <laughs> that would make it a little easier to explain. But there, there's this page where they, the way they wanted to do this was to put a bunch of random stuff in the room and then you had to find all the things in the room. So there's this whole thing, let's see, a find the chair. There's like books and a surfboard and Grenda's in there. Oh, there's the turtle. Turtle. That was in the cage. There's an apple. There's some, these are the books that went on the bookcase above the bed. There's like a trumpet. Things like that. Oh, there's a cat. Kitty cat. Some statues. Some other random things. A map. A bird. A seagull. Oh, now you're interested, Pan. Like some paintbrushes, things like that. A teddy bear that he kind of just put around the room. Pan, you can't. Come here. Pan, Pan. Come here. Come here. You can't jump on that. Okay. Anyway, he built that as kind of a. I guess it was a project. It was a, a search search room. I don't know what you call those pages. Like search and find. And I don't know. Anyway. So I just, he built that a few weeks ago, and he's like, oh, have you showed it yet? Because he wants to take it apart. <laughs> and uh, can't, can't, don't do that. I mean, he doesn't really want to take it apart, but he can put all the pieces away. So I said, I'll show it this week. Okay, here you go. Don't climb on that. You can lick the plastic. He likes licking plastic. He's weird. Anyway, so I wanted to show it because it's really cool. There's a lot of little details in there that are kind of hard to show but oh there's a trash bin in there but I think that my one of my favorite parts is the lamps both have cords that go down like they would be plugged in which is how it would be but you don't often think about those things when building things out of plastic bricks but that's really cool so those are the kinds of creative things you can do with Lego bricks uh, We'll go back to the game. So here's another game that is one of our favorites. It's called Suro. And we got Suro of the Seas. There's also a regular Suro that you can buy. 
and it's a game where you are a ship and you are sailing the high seas. This. It's a really pretty game. And let me get it out. And you are sailing the high seas on this board. And there's like these squares and you have these tiles with paths on them and you put them in front of your ship. Get out a ship to show you. So everyone's got a ship to sail around, different colors. And you you start at the edge of the board and then you have a hand of I think like three or four. I'm gonna fold this up because it's kind of large on my lap. And you have a few tiles to choose from. And the object is to not go off the board, basically, is to be the last person standing. So whichever place your ship is, you place this in front of you and then you will sail along that path. And that's basically the, the way it works. And then you put one next to it and then actually you probably wouldn't want to do that. You'd probably want to do that. So if you were up here, then you would go over here. And then you can put this one here and then I think you'd end up over there. Something like that. Anyway. And so it's really fun to sail around the seas. So the basic game, which is um, you are dragons going along the path. And it's just the paths. Um, the reason we got Sorrow of the Seas is it comes with these daikaiju or like sea dragons. Where are they? There's some buried in all these tiles. Where are they? Oh, oh, cat. There they are. They're down here. <laughs> They're hiding. So you have these, so I should show it right side up. These daikaiju are these sea dragons that are also on the board that can eat you and sink your ship. It's kind of crazy. So you have to avoid these guys, but they move every turn as well. Um, I think it also comes, I think that expansion comes with, you can also have cannons that you can use to, you know, blow them up. Uh, we did get an expansion for it that comes with like a tidal wave and a whirlpool and some other it's like the mystic portal of we haven't played with all of them yet because we we're trying to figure out how they worked. We have played with the daikaiju and the um, the cannons. Where are all like the oh here's the tidal wave. So you can have these tsunamis that um, wherever they start they just move until they're off the board. So you have to and you have to not be in that row or the tsunami will you know, not blow your ship up, but uh, tip it, sink it. So it's, it's a last man standing kind of thing. And it's really fun. And it's very easy to play. So it's great. It's a great family game as well. Now I'm trying to get all these pieces to fit in here. <laughs> Just go in. So that is Turo of the Seas. We really enjoyed that one. Ta da! What is it? A game of treacherous waters is what it is called. So that's Zero. And the last Lego thing that I wanted to show was the Lego bird set that I got for my birthday. And this is the box. Ta da! I don't tip it too far because the stuff is in here. But this was part of the Lego Ideas where you can submit designs and then people vote on them. And if you get enough votes, then Lego will consider making them as a set. So this is one of the ones that won. And it comes with three birds. Let's see if I can, I've not entirely taken them apart. I think this one goes in here. They have their let me make sure that I have this right. Yeah, okay. 
there's three different birds and they have their scientific names on here and I wanted to make sure I had the right one on the right stand. So they come with these stands and that all have the scientific name of the bird and then you just pop that in there. And this is a robin. And it's even got a little tail there. Moves. Wings don't come up, but they do. There is wings there. And very cool. And they even have like the legs perched on a little feet. They're kind of fun. So this is a set that I built on that introvert day that I told you about last week. I feel like I haven't podcasted in forever, but I know it's just been a week. It's kind of crazy. So that's one bird. And then the other one is this one, which is a blue jay, which is very cool. And these ones, the wings do slightly move. So I can show you here. So they're still folded, they don't like expand, but so the cat is trying to figure out how to get over here. Do you want to say hi to the birdie? You just want to watch. So that's that one, and no, 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 no. The other one, this is the one I kind of took apart in order to get it to work in the box. It's the hummingbird. It comes with bird and a flower. Here we go. I'll show you. Front view. But it comes with this flower that you can actually open up a little bit more. And there's even little, I don't know what you call those things in there. But it's really cool. And then there's the hummingbird. I guess the front looks kind of better than the back. But there's the bird, which is really well built. It's really cool. Ta-da! So eventually I will take these to work, but that means I have to bring something else home because my desk is getting a little full. I like that you can fold these up because then they'll, they travel better. I have to get a little, I'll figure that out. There we go. So they do come out, which means it will travel a little better. And in each of the books that come, so there's one book per, um, there's three books and one book per bird. And in the front, there's a ton of information about the bird set in general. And then about that specific bird, which I think is really interesting. And it's in a bunch of different languages. So, and then there's the general instructions. So I thought that that was a really nice touch to add that information about each bird so that you can learn about the birds as you're building them so it's kind of it's a, it's a great educational thing it would be great as an educational set to build with kids and say you know this is about this bird and this is what they look like and stuff like that anyway I'm figure out how to get this back in the box there we go it's not really gonna close but ta-da so those are the things I had to show you today. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm sorry there wasn't as much knitting as I would have liked, but that's what I have this week. Um, I've been working really hard on my new designs and hopefully they will be ready soon. The, the shawl is kind of the next big one. I've been thinking about that and I'm going to work on that this week because I think the socks are kind of on pause for a minute until I figure out how to do that heel turn. It's going to be really cool when I figure it out, but the top of the foot gusset is not something I do very often, so trying to make it work is a little, a little challenging. It's okay, I'll figure it out. <laughs> the other thing that I forgot to mention earlier is my cousin is getting married this coming weekend, 
and originally we didn't think we could go, but plans changed drastically and we're both going, which is really exciting. So I will, I'm already thinking about what knitting I'm going to take with me. So the shawl design is one of them and then I'll probably take a really easy pair of socks and maybe one other thing, but you know, to kind of have that broad spectrum of things, you know, something where I really have to think about it, something that I really don't have to think about, and then something kind of in the middle. So that's generally how I pack my knitting for trips. There is an episode a while back that I talk about travel knitting and what kind of things to take. Um, this, this trip is a little different because we actually are going on a plane. The last few trips we've taken are road trips, so the kind of knitting I take is a little different uh, just because I actually have to pay. Like, if I'm driving, I have to drive, and if I'm not driving, sometimes my husband needs me to, like, direct or figure out where we're going or whatever. So that type of knitting is a little different. And it depends what kind of events you're going to as well. Like this, we're just like, there's a wedding and then the next day is kind of part, they're doing, this is how we did our wedding where we had the wedding on one day and then kind of a, we had a small wedding and then a dinner right after it as kind of a small reception. And then the next day we had a big party where it was kind of like anyone can come, potluck kind of dealio. And so that's what they decided to do um, because my cousin, he came to our wedding as well. And so we're having the wedding on one day and then like a party on the next day, which is fun. I, I really liked doing that because I felt after the wedding and even after the dinner, uh, I wanted to see everyone again. Like these are people that have meant a lot to me in my life and you know, they traveled in a great distance, some of them, and I really liked having that chance to see them again. Uh, so that was a really awesome choice that we made. I don't know who came up with that, but it was great. I loved it. And so they're doing that too. So I'm like, it's great. I get to see people more. And because sometimes it's really hard. I actually felt like I saw more people at the dinner because it was smaller. There was less people. So I got to spend more time with people actually, you know, sat and had a conversation with them for more than like five seconds. Whereas the, the party the next day, there were so many people. A lot of them live in the area. So I see them fairly regularly. I'm not regularly, but you know, more regularly than my friends from out of town. So I tried to spend more time with my friends from out of town, but there's just a lot of people there. It got crazy. But I'm really looking forward to seeing some of my family members this weekend, and I'll be taking some knitting with me. So I'm not sure what the recording schedule is going to be. I can probably, I, I can just take this computer with me and record Sunday morning um, from the bed and breakfast where we're staying because I won't have anything else to do until the afternoon, really. We don't really have that many plans, which is good. I'm, I'm glad about that. <laughs> Some of my family vacations feel like very rigorous, so I'm glad that this is just kind of a relaxing one. Anyway, I've talked for a very long time, and I, I'm going to let you go for the week. And have a great week. Happy knitting, and I will see you next week. Bye.